Okay, well, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. My name is Eric Palmer, and I'll be the host for today's webinar, Simplifying Scientific Python Package Installation and Usage. The webinar will be presented by Amiya Maji. Amiya is a lead computational scientist at the Rosin Center for Advanced Computing at Purdue University, where he collaborated with faculty and researchers from various scientific domains to optimize their computational and data analysis workflows. Amiya is an avid advocate for software reliability and security, and he has developed several algorithms and tools for software testing, both during his graduate studies at Purdue ECE and then at the Rosin Center. Amiya leads the software build automation project for Purdue's community clusters. He was awarded a, 2020, a 2022 Better Scientific Software BSSW Fellowship. We have issued more than 200 tickets for today's webinar and all attendees have been muted upon entry. We will receive questions through the Zoom chat and also a Google doc whose address I will paste in the chat momentarily. We've also asked Amiya to add breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, with that, Amiya, if you're ready, I'll let you uh, start sharing your slides and begin. All right. Uh, can everyone share my slides? Yes. Can you do it, uh, the presentation? Yep. Yes. Perfect. How do I move? The, okay. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to you if you are in the East Coast or Good morning. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. Um, very excited to see so many people for this webinar. Uh, obviously, uh, Python is our favorite topic of conversation, right? Uh, just like a good scientist, so uh, this morning, uh, I was trying to chat with my friend, ChatGPT, right? And we asked ChatGPT to solve our problem. So I asked it about solving our Python packaging worries, right? And I'll, I'll show you uh, what we found out from, from ChatGPT's chat, right? Uh, so I was asking like, why is installing scientific Python packages so challenging? And usually when, when I, ask vague questions to chat GPT, it hallucinates, right? Uh, if I ask it something about Purdue's HPC site and, and our HPC documentation, it gives some very random answers that are uh, really, really bad. And, and you, you cannot make any uh, sense of those answers. But in this case, when I asked it about why Python packages are so challenging to install, it came back with some pretty coherent and very accurate answers. Uh, dependency management, system compatibility, version compatibility, uh, something that I had not experienced a lot myself, uh, network and repository issues. Obviously that is a big issue for, for a lot of people. Uh, security concerns, documentation, uh, virtual environments, adding complexity. Uh, all of these are, are very, very good reasons. And in a moment, I'll, I'll show you uh, a list of challenges that I had prepared by surveying a lot of the documentations from various HPC sites. And there is a large degree of overlap between what Chat GPT taught me and, and what I learned myself by uh, studying these documentations. Uh, and, and then I probed it further, like 
why is it such a mess? And and it came back with with against uh, some pretty convincing arguments, rapid development, uh, legacy code, interoperability, evolving ecosystem, all of these things are, are very, very good uh, reasons and arguments why installing Python packages are so challenging. Uh, the point I'm trying to make with ChatGPT is uh, installing Python packages is obviously such a big challenge for so many people. There is obviously a large amount of training data in the internet. And if ChatGPT is giving me coherent answers, that means a lot of people are suffering uh, from these uh, issues with installing Python packages. And more specifically on HPC systems, we have seen uh, a lot of issues uh, coming from users, especially uh, novice users or, or intermediate users who have started using HPC clusters. Uh, they are very, very confused about uh, how to install Python packages on HPC clusters, right? Uh, they may get away with, with installing packages on their laptops, uh, but those same instructions don't work on HPC clusters. Uh, so if you are not convinced with my chat GPT argument, uh, here is one more slide from XKCT where uh, they are showing a comic strip about uh, how Python packages or, or Python installation can get you into trouble, right? So there are various different package managers, various uh, environment managers. Uh, you can have multiple versions of Pythons. You can install one package from one package manager, another package from another package manager, uh, different Python versions, and it can become really messy really soon. So beginning in, in 2018, 2019, uh, we, we started getting a lot of complaints from our students and faculties and researchers at Purdue. Uh, and, and they are asking all of these uh, sometimes simple, sometimes very complex question about Python package installation. Uh, simple questions like, how can I install TensorFlow or PyTorch. Hey, why can't I see my PyTorch installation in Jupyter Hub? Uh, why can't I do sudo pip install and, and all these things? Uh, so when we started getting this large volume of tickets, uh, we had to stop and think how we can help uh, the researchers and the students and the faculties uh, better, right? So what are the problems that, that we are facing? So in this talk, uh, I, I'm going to give you a high level overview of uh, various challenges that uh, I have personally seen students face in, in managing Python packages and also what we have found from um, documentation from various HPC sites. Uh, why is managing Python packages on HPC clusters such, uh, such a challenge? And then how can we simplify uh, this process or these workflows through some kind of automation, right? Uh, and, and how can we help manage the Python environment uh, in a better, more consistent, and more reproducible manner. And I'll, I'll give you uh, a bit more context and a bit more details as we uh, go more into the presentation. Uh, and then the other one is how can we empower interactive Python users? And by interactive, I mean mostly uh, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter uh, Notebook users, who are trying to use various Python packages inside this, uh, this notebook environments. Uh, so for the, for the next part of the presentation, so I'll highlight the, the challenges that we have seen 
come up very often uh, when, when uh, people are trying to manage their Python packages on HPC clusters. And then I'll present a brief overview of different best practices that I have seen from various HPC sites. And I'll highlight why we need to automate uh, a lot of these workflows and, and how we can simplify uh, Python package management and environment management uh, through simple tools. So we developed a tool at Purdue called Conda ENV Mod, uh, which basically is a uh, wrapper around Anaconda environments and it helps users uh, create and activate environments uh, very easily uh, along with Jupyter kernel creation and, and so on and so forth. And I'll give you uh, an overview of how that works and why uh, we believe that that's a good direction to go. And I'll share some success stories you, with you as well. Okay. With that, uh, so when we did the survey of this, uh, various HPC Python documentation, uh, we saw a lot of these uh, issues are obviously uh, complex dependencies. And a lot of the Python packages, they depend not only on other Python packages, but also depend on system libraries, right? So that's where uh, a documentations, a lot of the documentations uh, say that you need to install this with RPM or you need to install this with apt. And obviously those things don't work on HPC system. You have to either hope that you have a module that you can load and get those libraries, or you have to ask your system administrator to install it for you, right? Or, or you have to build it from source. Uh, a lot of these dependencies, uh, on other Python libraries, other system libraries, uh, updates to various packages uh, that happen very frequently. And then sometimes package definitions can also have missing dependencies, right? Uh, updating packages later can break your existing environment and, and then it becomes very challenging to reproduce your environment consistently over time. Right? Uh, other things we have seen is uh, sharing installations with people. Uh, when you have 10 different people trying to install the same set of Python packages, uh, they go very differently depending on what you might already have in your environment or how your environment is initialized. Uh, so all of those are, are interesting or challenging problems that we see uh, more specifically on HPC systems where uh, you do not have full control of the system, right? So you have to rely on uh, how the system has been configured and you have to install everything in your uh, user directories. The other challenges that I have noticed is uh, running parallel programs with Python, right? Uh, running MPI 4Py or H5Py, those kind of things uh, can generate a lot of uh, IOs and, and that can cripple a file system or cause file system issues. So how can you uh, handle those kind of workflows uh, in, a, in a much uh, better manner or, or in a much uh, uh, much coherent manner so that you don't you don't trash the entire system right uh, security policies I don't go into details about that um, it varies from side to side but again that that can add another layer of complexity uh, we have seen that happen with uh, our export control enabled cluster at Purdue and, and uh, it has been a persistent challenge to, to install Python packages on, on those kind of systems. Uh, so a high level overview of, of this uh, 
HPC Python documentations uh, that I uh, that we reviewed, uh, we, we looked at documentations from various uh, national labs, uh, university HPC centers, uh, some international HPC centers, and there were several common themes across those, right? So on HPC systems, the plain and simple thing is you need to use some kind of a virtual environment, right? So you cannot directly do pip install or conda install uh, in your directories when the installation is uh, controlled by a site administrator, right? Uh, you have to use some kind of virtual environment to isolate your installations uh, and install it into the appropriate file system install things from source rather than downloading binaries because you don't know if the binary is optimized uh, or if it will work on your architecture, right? Uh, other themes are do not install your Python packages in your home directories uh, because it can create IO issues and you can run into issues if you have shared home directory across clusters uh, that have different architectures, right? Uh, and then I mentioned about MPI with Python and, and that needs special care. So several sites, uh, I remember NERSC and Oak Ridge, they have very detailed documentation about how to install MPI for Pi or how to install uh, H5 by, and, and those are pretty complex instructions for users to follow, right? So when you have uh, 10, 15 instructions or 10, 15 steps to install one package, uh, that can be very complicated to, to follow and uh, repeatedly perform over a period of time, right? So, the point we noticed was this, these kind of complex workflows like installing MPI for Pi or creating Jupyter kernel. So these can be easily automated, right? Or not easily, but, that, but these need to be automated at least to some extent so that it makes it easier for, for the users. And some sites do that uh, pretty easily, pretty well. Uh, I, ha I have seen the CSCS, the Swiss national site, they have uh, a script for creating Jupyter kernels or uh, creating environments that allow you to uh, use it in a, in a Jupyter environment. And uh, we do the same thing at Purdue as well. Uh, at NERSC, we, we saw that uh, they provide a base environment for MPI for Pi or H5 Pi. Uh, you can just clone the base environment and install your additional packages on top of that. Uh, that way, uh, you don't have to worry about the various uh, compiler dependencies, various MPI dependencies. Uh, those have been created for you. And, and I think uh, those kind of simplifications, uh, some degree of automation uh, can help tremendously in enabling uh, reproducible research in an HPC environment. Now, going from the common theme to the dissimilarities, uh, we also noticed there were uh, documentations that were very, very uh, sketchy. Sketchy in the sense that it did not have enough details, right? Uh, and, and that can be very frustrating for, for users because all the documentation they read from the packages websites, they are usually for personal laptops. And it, it's not trivial for, for people to reproduce that or, or to translate those instructions from personal laptops to a HPC system. Uh, so we need to improve documentations quite significantly. And then there are differences in opinions about 
using binary packages or using Anaconda versus uh, other environment managers, right? So some sites or most of the sites, uh, they recommend using Anaconda. It, it has a pretty good environment management uh, system. So you can create and manage your environment pretty easily with Anaconda. But then when you are installing things, you still want to use uh, installation from source as much as possible. Uh, in terms of common use cases, uh, again, these, these vary from package to package. There are very simple packages to very complex packages, uh, but broadly uh, speaking, the, the common use cases are like, how can I install this Python package on this HPC system? Or how do I use this Python package in a Jupyter netbook? Uh, how can I share my Python environment with a colleague? Uh, how can I list the packages in my environment? How can I recreate my existing environment? And so on. Uh, so most of the documentations, they focus on uh, specific technologies or specific environment packets, right? So the documentations would say, okay, you are using virtual and so these are the 10 commands you need to take, you need to use to, to create or install your package uh, on our HPC system. And if you are using Conda, you have, another set of 10 commands to, to do it with Conda. Uh, going from specific implementation to actual tasks that users need to perform, uh, we tried to identify how can we uh, represent that workflow in, into a set of tasks rather than a set of specific commands, right? And, and we came up with this diagram where we are trying to capture all of these 10 common use cases into specific tasks or workflows, right? So for example, if you are wanting to use a specific package in Jupyter, uh, you first need to create a virtual environment, that's step one, Step two, you need to activate that environment. Step three, you need to install the package that you want. Step four, you need to install IPy kernel because that's what you need to use it in a Jupyter environment. Uh, you also need to generate a Jupyter kernel and then you can launch the appropriate Jupyter kernel and use that package in Jupyter. And, and so, as, as you can see, for, for Jupyter, the steps are, uh, there are several steps in this workflow. And, and for novice or intermediate users, uh, doing these steps repeatedly without error, that can be pretty challenging at times. And we can automate a lot of these processes uh, through simple scripts. Another thing we noticed from, from this diagram was a lot of these workflows, uh, they go through this activate environment block, right? So essentially, how can we capture my Python runtime environment reliably and reproducibly, right? So when you are installing the packages, uh, the set of system modules, the set of uh, other environment variables that are in the environment, uh, that need to be same when you are running those packages as well, right? How can we capture all of this information? Uh, typical environment managers in Python, they do not capture what's outside of the Python environment, right? Uh, they don't know what modules you have loaded. They don't know about other dependencies outside of your environment, right? So how can we capture all of those things? And, and then I already 
mentioned the, the need for automation and we found that a lot of the things that are recommended in these documentations, uh, these can be simplified through uh, either through configuration files or by setting sensible default values, right? So what's the default location for my environments, right? Uh, if you don't specify anything, it goes to your home directory. But uh, if you know you have a specific file system where you want to create all your environment, you can set that as a default environment location. Uh, you can set a default location where your package cache uh, goes. That way you won't be depleting space in your home directory. Uh, same thing for, for uh, Trading configuration like OMP num threads. If you are doing MPI with Python and uh, you are using NumPy or SciPy, they have implicit threading. So you, you might end up oversubscribing your course. Uh, so you can set all of those defaults a priori so that users don't have to worry about uh, those kind of things when they are installing or configuring their Python uh, runtime environments. And then as I mentioned, some workflows uh, definitely require uh, some degree of automation or uh, simplification like Jupyter kernel and uh, MPI 4Py and so on. Uh, so all of these findings that, that we uh, noticed or the observations from these various documentations, uh, you can find this in this read the doc site. And I would appreciate uh, comments or suggestions from all of you. Uh, please uh, create GitHub issues on this. Uh, if you have a specific complex workflow that you, or you have some ideas about simplifying many of these Python workflows, uh, please share your ideas uh, on that on that repository. Uh, Amir, on that note, um, yep. there's one question in the Q&A where someone asks, we try to teach our PhD students to prevent using any tools by Anaconda. Um, it also says in parentheses, I would even prevent using Conda. What do you think about poetry? Do you have any comments on this question? Um, maybe briefly before you move on. That, that's a good question. I have not used poetry myself uh, yet. Uh, that's on my bucket list. So I, I cannot comment about poetry, sorry. Uh, I have to take that offline. Sounds great, thanks. All right. Okay, so uh, any other questions so far? There, there are a few other questions, but I think you're gonna address them later in the presentation. So I've been holding off. Okay, all right. Thanks. All right, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll move into uh, the next part of the presentation where uh, we, highlight the solution that we developed at Purdue uh, to simplify some of these uh, some of these things for our students and, and researchers at Purdue. Uh, we, we developed a tool called Conda ENV mod. So Conda is obviously Anaconda and ENV mod is basically environment modules. Right? And I'll give you more uh, in-depth details of why we think environment modules are good for managing uh, Python environment or are good for using and uh, creating this, this Python uh, package ecosystem in an HPC system, right? So with Conda ENV mod, uh, what we recommend users to do is instead of directly asking Conda to install things, uh, 
you tell Conda EMP mod that, hey, I want to create an environment, uh, something, right? And you can specify a name, you can give it a prefix, you can uh, give it a specification file, a YAML file. Uh, what it does behind the scenes, it, it creates that Anaconda environment uh, from your uh, requirement. And then it will generate a environment module from that environment. So the, the word environment is, is uh, very overloaded. So I, I might be mixing runtime environment with uh, Python environment and environment module. So uh, please bear with me. And if you are confused, uh, stop me and, and ask questions. Uh, and Another thing it can do is if you tell it that to that I want to use it, use this environment in Jupyter, it will also automatically install IPy kernel uh, and generate a Jupyter kernel for you. Right? And then you can go ahead and, and use the environment. So all you need to do is load the module uh, that has been created for your Python environment. And this module file essentially does what I have been talking about before that set sensible default values, uh, initialize your environment locations to, to good places, uh, set your num thread values and, and all those things. So all of those runtime set up the environments, uh, your Python path, your uh, LD library path, and so on, everything is described in this module file. And once you load that module file, now you don't need to do anything about conda activate or conda init or so on. Uh, you can just directly do your package install with pip install or conda install, uh, just like you would do on your laptop, right? So before going further, uh, I'll give you a brief demo of uh, how you can use Conda EMP mod to, to install packages on, on HPC system, right? And I'm here on, on one of our Purdue systems. Uh, basically, all you need to do is, uh, Tell Conda EMP mod that I want to create an environment and I want to call it, let's say, okay, I'll try test three. I forgot what's the last test environment I created. Uh, and I want to create this environment from a specification file and this test slash environment.yaml. And this is actually a very simple environment. Uh, which is installing Sphinx, right? And this is how my environment.yaml looks like. So I have uh, Python a whole and whole bunch of Python related dependencies. And then I have uh, Sphinx installed through PIP. Okay. And oops, yeah, all right. And as I do, conda env mod create. And then the specification file. And that's it. So Behind the scenes, it's using Anaconda to create the environment from that YAML file and it's installing the dependencies. And once it's done, it will generate the module file for me. And the next step I need to do is basically load this module file, right? So in order to use this module, I need to tell uh, my environment module software where to find this uh, module file. So that's uh, module use this 
private modules directory. So this is the default location. You can also change it to, to any directory you want. Uh, and then you basically load your environment as a module, right? And by default, again, we call it Conda ENV. The module name is Conda ENV. Uh, and we add the Python version to it so that it's the environment is explicit and, and you remember what Python you use there. Uh, and once you have loaded this environment, your uh, or, or this module file, your environment and your runtime is basically set up, right? And the module file in this case uh, looks pretty simple. Uh, if I do module show, so all it's doing is basically it's it's setting your environment prefix, uh, your LD library path, Python path, and then we also tell uh, Python not to use user site location uh, because sometimes people would do pip install minus minus user and that can create a lot of confusion and a lot of conflict with uh, environments and, and other Python packages, right? And now if I do, uh, which Sphinx build, this should come from my environment. Uh, I told you about not creating environments in home directories, but this is a demo, so, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say this, this is just for the purpose of the demo, uh, don't create your environments in home directories. Uh, you don't need to do conda activate or conda in it, right? And if you want to install additional packages, you can just uh, go ahead and install other packages like uh, I can do pip install Sphinx, uh, let's say RTD. Okay, so this, this will, since your environment is activated uh, through the module file, uh, it will know where to install this things RTD theme and uh, it will put it there. Wow, that's interesting download rate. I don't know why that's 70 kilobytes. Uh, Amir, a quick question. Yeah. Someone asked, mm -hmm. was, the, was prefix pointing to home directory? Uh, in this case, the prefix, uh, do you mean the prefix in the environment.yaml or just in general? Lulian, if you want to uh, unmute to clarify, you're, you're welcome to. He says yes, or they say yes, sorry. Uh, yes to, <laughs> yes, please. Um, what, what were the, yes to, oh. Lillian, what, yes to which, which one, unfortunately? Maybe you can type out which one you were asking about. It says environment. Okay, okay. Yeah, so um, the environment.yaml, that, kind of gets ignored. Uh, in this case, my, my Anaconda was set up in a manner that uh, all environments by default go to home directory. That's just for the demo purposes. All right. Okay, so this time, uh, yeah. So the, the Sphinx RTD theme that that got created successfully and uh, it went to my environment. Uh, and I didn't need to do Conda activate. Right. And besides creating, uh, you can also export uh, 
your environment or you can create module files or Jupyter kernel definition from a standalone environment. So if you happen to create a uh, Python environment outside of this tool and you want to generate a module file for your Python environment, you can use this uh, to generate the module file. Uh, either as a TCL module file uh, or a Lua format uh, LMOD module file. And then obviously you can, you can list or delete your existing environments and so on. Now, why environment modules, right? Uh, so environment modules are uh, very powerful tools that have been around in, in HPC for a long time, right? Uh, and, and it allows us or gives us a programmatic way to set up your runtime environment uh, for running your workflows uh, with different software, right? So you can, with module files, you can start with a clean environment, you can load whatever modules you need for this particular workflow, you can run your workflow, then clean up your environment again and run a totally different workflow with a different set of modules. And, and it provides that compact way of initializing your runtime environment. And the, the module file takes care of setting all the system variables like path and Python path and ND library path and so on. And you don't have to worry about doing that yourself. So that's why we thought that environment modules are the way to um, use this Python environments uh, on a HPC system uh, in a more compact, more reproducible way. And the other benefit is uh, the environment module that I showed you, uh, that was just, just a demo. That's a simple environment module for a Python environment, but you can also incorporate a lot of uh, best practices into that module file. Like I mentioned about OMP num threads uh, or, or other sensible default values, you can, put those into the module file template, and that will automatically get translated to uh, the module file that's generated for the user. Another big thing is you can now track dependencies on system modules, right? So once you have created the environment module for a Python environment, you can also capture what compilers or what MPI libraries or what other system modules you had loaded at the time of creating that environment, right? So you can, that way you can remember what system modules you needed uh, to install your Python packages and, and how you installed your environment. Uh, you can also add help messages in the module files and I already mentioned about uh, not having to use conda init and conda activate. We, we found these are very, very problematic because uh, it creates codes in your bash RC that uh, causes a lot of conflicts with GUI applications, Jupyter and, and various other applications uh, that you might run. And then, uh, the other benefit is now sharing Python installation within a cluster is as simple as exchanging a module file or a kernel definition. Right? Uh, for example, in a research group, one person can manage a Python environment in a, in a shared directory. And then you can just, the, all the other students or the other researchers in the lab can just uh, load the module for that or, or the kernel for that, right? And another benefit is 
now that you don't have to do conda activate you can also do stacked environments with these module files right for example if you are working on a large python project you can have a set of stable packages and you can install it in one environment generate a module x and forget about it right you never change that environment uh, you can have another environment with a bunch of experimental packages that change often, and you need to recreate that environment. Uh, you call it module Y, and for your full workflow, you can now load module X and Y. Basically, you are activating two separate environment at the same time. Uh, and, and that way, you don't have to worry about reinstalling everything from scratch uh, if something goes wrong. Now, one caveat there is uh, obviously you need the same Python version across the environments. And that's why we, we have that Python version in the module name itself. Uh, that way people can remember and distinguish. And for going from HPC to individual Python developers, uh, this is also a very good way for, for sharing your environment. For example, uh, generating your uh, environment specification, the environment.yaml. Uh, if you don't have a module file environment or module file software on your laptop, uh, our future goal is to just export or, or create a bash script for uh, activating your environment, right? So that way you, you don't have to rely on those uh, mechanisms provided by the environment manager itself to uh, do some strange things that may not work for your project. Uh, Generating Jupyter kernel is, is another benefit that, that you can uh, get from this tool. All right, so before I go into success stories, any questions at this point? Uh, Mia, I think a lot of the questions you were addressing with your, with your talk, um, so I haven't been pulling any out um, at this point. So I think uh, we can keep going. Okay, awesome. All right, um, so success stories. I, I have uh, two things here and, and both of those are, are very dear to my heart. Uh, so I mentioned that, that we started getting all these tickets or issues when, when we uh, got requests for a lot of deep learning packages on our cluster. So, we, we had to install a lot of these deep learning packages across multiple Python versions, uh, CPU and GPU combination and, and uh, different clusters over a period of time. And, and this Conda ENV mod basically uh, helped simplify that tremendously, right? So uh, I could just write a simple script to run across different Python versions, CPU and GPU and, and install say 60, 70 different variation of uh, deep learning packages in a matter of uh, few hours right? or, or even minutes. Um, and that, that was a very uh, helpful tool for us to manage or maintain uh, the deep learning packages uh, on our clusters. And then the other uh, dear success story I have is uh, about managing Python environment for teaching. So we had a faculty uh, who was uh, trying to teach his students how to install a very few Python packages, like four or five Python packages for a course. And they had 40, 50 students, uh, even though he had 
tested his installation procedure and his instructions very, very thoroughly. Uh, when the 40 students tried to install the packages, they got very different results, right? Uh, different students had other packages in their user site packages. They had different environments set up, different modules loaded, and, and they got, uh, basically they, they, their installation did not succeed and uh, they were very, very confused. Uh, so when, when the faculty talked to us, we, we told him that, hey, why don't you try this tool, uh, Conda ENV mod, and all you need to do is create this environment yourself and ask your students to just load the modules. And they don't have to install anything by themselves. And the next class, uh, the faculty was very, very happy and, and all the students got to their homework and successfully finished that. So it was a very gratifying feeling for, for us as well. Uh, and, and I mentioned about shared Python environment for research group, uh, similar concept for like, like teaching environment uh, and, and people have been using it successfully, successfully across uh, multiple research groups at Purdue. Uh, for for managing their Python packages and their environments uh, across the lab. So to summarize, uh, I, I would say we have tried to capture the best practices for uh, scientific Python package installation and, and uh, tried to simplify that uh, in, in some manner through these automations uh, that, that we provide through Conda ENV pod. And uh, this has, has helped uh, our users and students and faculties alike uh, in, in uh, going, uh, going on with their research and their work uh, in a much simpler manner than uh, they would have had if, if uh, they had to do everything by hand uh, or, or by themselves. Right? And the other goal of, of mine from this project is to basically engage the scientific Python community. Uh, please share your, your complex workflows and your use cases uh, with us. Uh, Please post comments on, on this uh, best practices document as well as the Conda ENP mod download site. Uh, please post your comments, issues, suggestions on the, on the GitHub page. Uh, I would really appreciate uh, all contributions. Uh, Acknowledgement, so this work was uh, partially sponsored by the, the BSSW Fellowship. Uh, which is sponsored by, by the DOE and the NSF. And thank you to, to the entire BSSW community for, for their feedback, uh, for, for the fellowship and, and the mentoring and so on. Uh, big thanks to Hia. Uh, she was my, my mentor in the BSSW fellowship project and Lisa uh, both kept me on track on, on this work. Uh, and then big thanks to, to my colleagues and co-contributors, uh, Lev Gorenstein, who, who did quite a bit of coding for Honda NV mod and Zihan, who uh, was my student and also contributed to the project. Uh, before jumping into question, uh, I have one announcement. So the 2024 BSSW Fellowship Program uh, is open for submission and the submission deadline is September 29th. So uh, if, if you are uh, a research software engineer and you have innovative ideas for uh, improving software uh, quality, then please do uh, apply for this fellowship. Uh, I'm really, really happy that that I did, and 
it was a very rewarding and fulfilling experience for me. So uh, please do apply for the fellowship uh, before September 29th. And with that, uh, I'll take questions. So thank you very much, Amir, for your talk. Um, the, you know, given we only have a few minutes before we reach the hour, um, I'll pull out some of these questions from the Q&A doc. Um, I'd also give, like to give people the chance to unmute and ask their question directly. Um, so Michael Forbes, you have a question about dependency resolution across stacked environments. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? I think he left already. He said that in one of the other uh, questions. I see. So, okay. So I'll read the question for you, Amia. Um, the question is, how does dependency resolution work across stacked environments? Uh, I.e., what happens if a sub-environment has a non-Python dependency that conflicts with the base environment? Uh, non-Python dependency that conflicts. Uh, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, so in, in that case, at least with LMOD uh, that we are using at Purdue, uh, the sub environment will not be uh, will not be loaded, right? So if you have a module conflict between two modules, then then you would not be able to load that. Uh, so that's that's a good thing because then you can go back and uh, fix your conflict and and get a compatible dependency. Yeah, it looks like quite a few questions here are about uh, compatibility with other modules. Um, I'll, you know, I'll let you address them uh, in the Q&A doc afterwards. Uh, there is another question from William. Uh, does you want to ask your question about the Conda environment mod and generating LMOD modules? I think that's implied to be yes. Okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, I think there's a, a few more questions that are probably best left for a sort of discussion in the Q&A doc. Um, so with that, um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, I've got one more slide to show as we exit out um, to thank everybody for coming to the webinar and to remind them that uh, we do uh, do a survey and we appreciate your feedback on these um, on this HPC webinar series. Uh, so let me put that up there now. And once again, uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Amia, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. And thank you everyone for, for the great questions. Uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, there's my email address. Uh,